Today is October 17th, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the uh, Extinction Nadi Western Desiderato meeting, and we'll do um, a roll call again of our contacts. So uh, with Derek Jensen, uh, Heather has been trying to get, get him, but it's been tough. So um, I think she says she has some dates in November, so uh, we'll, we'll have, I'll get back to you on that. But uh, other than that, um, that's it for me. Yeah, I haven't got much to report. So um, I, you know, Gary wanted me to invite Lionel to these meetings. So I did, but he said uh, it's not really kind of much of a joiner. So I, I don't know. He might, um, but I'm not really expecting him to. And had a little trouble with internet from South Africa. Um, oh, uh, uh, I so want to stop you, Hugh, because um, Lionel, I actually came an hour earlier. Lionel came. I told him the meeting won't start for another hour. He said he couldn't, he couldn't make it then, but he he tried the earlier. Yeah, I was surprised to see him. Ah, oh, damn! It's the um, time zones again. <laughs> right, right. Uh, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, also, okay, so maybe he'll come next time um, if he knows. I'll remind him again. Um, in terms of the IB stuff, I've just been waiting to see, you know, what happened now. They're on pause. And, uh, yeah. Um, I, uh, I saw that on Monday the UK um, Minister of Finance is going to announce, um, well, their targets for COP26 is... Um, is going to, they're going to try and meet them by nuclearization. So that's going to be their prime policy. But I saw buried in there, they said something about infrastructure bill that sounded like it might be a concession to, you know, roundabout backhand way to, to IB, which, you know, would be amazing result if they did actually concede to the demand. Um, so anyway, that landscape will change and stuff. So the, the involvement actually doing the you know, particularly the ARG stuff is um, is not uh, on fire like I thought it would be. It was, you know, it's more like wait and see how the, this results. You know, I I still think it's kind of a dead end strategy because you know it's like where where do you go with this if you you know even if you took over the government um, in the wildest sense, um, it's. I can't really see what the government is supposed to do about the climate crisis and things like that. Um, so, yeah, uh, I can see the point in having a revolution because things are about to get very authoritarian. Um, so, but, you know, as we were talking about um, in the meeting this morning is making these huge grandstanding stands, I don't know, man, I think... Um, 
you know, it's uh, you know, the immune system of the, you, you're not evading the immune system. The immune system is going to gobble you up this way. Um, so even if it works in Britain, it's not really exportable. So it seems a bit short-sighted, but anyway, we just have to see how that unfolds and it's going to take from there. Um, may I just say um, that I, yeah, I think I sent you an email from Paul Kingsnorth and uh, he's, he's happy to talk to us. He said he'd rather be on recorded. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I suggested what you said, Hugh. I told him we could do an unrecorded first, and and we could do another one if he likes the, you know, if it if it goes well. So I'm waiting for him to get back to me um, on for some dates. So I'll I'll let you know when that's happening. Otherwise, I have no news from the UK from uh, any probation officers yet. Um, <laughs> I was um, Paul Kingsnorth this morning. We we talked about. A lot of things, AI, intelligence, reading, words, writing. And because we're inviting Paul Kingsnorth, there's, I don't know if you can see this book that I have of him that was published in 2019, Savage Gods. Savage Gods. And um, it's, it's a book where he starts to have a crisis of belief in words, and he's a writer. So it's it's. I think it's a good. It's. I, I'd be happy to. I, I'm actually. I've read it, but I I could look at it again before we meet with Paul because maybe we could start on that on a subject that he has. He has written on recently, and it might be more interesting because his crisis of faith. I honestly, I honestly don't think it would be a a, a good topic to. <laughs> well, well, you can't. You can't avoid it. You can't avoid it because. A crisis of words is a crisis of faith. It, it's you know it says in the New Testament, John's, John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So if you're having a crisis with words, you're having a crisis with God. So that's the logos. Uh, you know, I, I don't. But you know, this get, morning, well, we I haven't I... got very mystical yet. But but in the in the morning meetings, talking about AI, I haven't got very woo woo yet. But it no. is extremely woo-woo, exactly what AI is. <laughs> this morning, during the meeting, I, I posted a little comment on the side that was the introduction of James C. Scott uh, for, of Against the Grain. And you mentioned him actually during the meeting, but it's an it's a introduction by a French anthropologist that I like very much. His name is Claude Lévi-Strauss. He did a lot of very interesting works in anthropology. And he says, writing appears to be necessary for the centralized, stratified state to reproduce itself. Writing is a strange thing. The one phenomenon which has invariably accompanied the formation of cities and empires, the integration into a political space, that is to say, of a considerable number of individuals into a hierarchy of castes and classes. It seems to favor rather the exploitation than the enlightenment of mankind. And this is from a writer, too. <laughs> and that's Well, yeah, I mean, writing was weaponized right from the yeah. start. If you have a look at the, the very first contracts on cuneiform tablets, they, they're bonding people. They, you see, it's, it's um, an infallible witness. A piece of clay is an infallible witness. So they're trying to say, hey, you know, the very first instances of writing in cuneiform, they, it's, they're saying things like it's, they can't interpret the whole thing, but it's pretty obvious once you know what, what it, that it's a contract. It's saying that like uh, Mahmoud or whatever his name is, Mehmet or something, is the very first name we've ever seen. The very first individual that's ever been named is on this one cuneiform uh, tablet, the oldest one we, we know. And that... That nobody has a name before that, you know. If in all the cave paintings and everything, there's no signature of an artist except maybe the handprints. One guy has a broken finger in the Shobi caves, and you can see he's one of the major artists. Um, but apart from that, there are no signatures. There's no identifiers of individuals. And then this, the very first identifier of an individual is this guy like Mehmet, and and he's named. In the in the thing in, in in phonetics, and then it's clear what they're saying that Mehmet 
has to deliver like 40, 40 bushels of grain uh, at the place and the time. So it's uh, this festival in in Samaria and like Nepal. And so, so you, there you see the essence of what writing is. It names an individual, right? Basically tattoos them and bit, <coughs> does a bit of biometrics on them. It, and it bounds them so that they, they can't deny that the contract was ever made, which is the problem yeah, with uh, verbal agreements is, is they are deniable. And, I, and so I there you have it. It's bondage. It's, awesome. it's putting somebody in bondage. And that's what writing is for. Yeah, it's funny with the um, you know Native Americans being uh, afraid of uh, having a photo taken of them stealing their soul and that kind of thing. But if you if you are um, having uh, a notepad in front of you and someone's taking notes when you're speaking, you become very careful about what you say because you know that that can be used as a threat, as a weapon against you later. It's uh, you you need to be deliberate because. You know that you can't just uh, wave it off as we're humans talking. It's you. You have future power against me with that notebook. Well, that that's how it goes in the court case. And what the prosecution does is 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 try and thwart your memory. So it's it's basically dehumanizing you, and giving themselves superpowers because the prosecution attorney will go back. You know, the prosecution is is adversarial. And then if you understand, they will try and uh, get catch you out and, and catch you out in terms of your memory. So they'll say, so they say, well, you know, according to the deposition and the stenographer said, your words were, and they read your words back from your past. So what, what they're doing is they're getting your past self to confound your current self to, to your de detriment. Now, you know, the state never has that, you know, apart from maybe historians and stuff writing you know, shit posting about the state. Maybe journalism could be considered stuff like that. But in in general, um, the state uh, and the the landlord, they don't really have uh, that kind of jeopardy. They don't really run that kind of jeopardy of the record uh, because they they set up the record. Uh, you know, in commercial law, is mainly about breach of contract, and so they set up the contract. And so you know, it's it's you're you're it's kind of in, you're in double jeopardy because they bound you once and now by having a court case, they're going to trip you up and bind you again by what you say in the short term. So it's, it's a vicious system, but yeah. that's what its purpose was. Everybody thinks it's for literature and doing Mary Shelley and Shakespeare. No, it was to bind people and that's the way it is. But the vast majority of ink spilt on paper today, you know, today, I mean, this Sunday will have been commercial contracts bounding you know, uh, it, things like bonds, financial instruments, they're called bonds for a reason, because they bind people. Uh, so it's it's fundamentally a violent, coercive system, and writing is at the heart of it. It was always weaponized. That's why the scribes were, you know, vetted. They didn't let anybody become a scribe. You had to basically be part of, you know, pro the system. Right. Uh, it's that's the currency that you can redeem for state violence uh, for the monopoly on violence is if you if you have enough records on someone you know you that's that's how you can redeem it for for violence against your neighbor yeah as long as you have enough laws then you can make everybody a transgressor and then that gives you the power because you have the, the power to prosecute them or not so you, you can elect to prosecute some people and not others, and that's that's the definition, the very definition of power. So we see today the, the super rich get away with anything, and they use their monopoly power on the courts and their money to arm wrestle the little people. So it's the very definition of power. Well, I, I wouldn't say the super rich get away with everything. Like Angela Merkel had her phone tapped and, and everything. Like it doesn't matter how powerful you are, you are still being eaten by the state. Or by by the system, I mean, not by the state. Uh, yeah, but I mean, how you know how much jeopardy is is Bill Gates in and, uh, from from all of this? I don't. I think he he runs in, increasingly this supernatural supernational bunch of these uh, very rich guys that um, really the the nation's serving them and it's convenient for them. 
Right. But they're not total counts. To, to some degree. I mean, they they don't need passports necessarily for if you've got a private jet, so the airports will let you land without checking you in security and that kind of thing. Like um, that there are there's like a separate set of rules for, for those people. Um, but at the same time, it, it's only as it pleased the court. Right. It's only as it um, as long as you're supporting the, the ruling uh, ruling powers, you get those, uh, those perks. It, it's, it's just like the, um, like you've said before, the COPPO system, like you get special perks for, for being the ones that, that help, uh, prop the system up. Yeah. What, what's amazed me over my career is how quickly or how low the bar is, uh, where it kicks in. And it's, it's almost like an officer class. But there's a definite class boundary where everything suddenly, all the rules are waived and you suddenly get a free pass and nothing that applies to the average person applies to you. And it, it happened to me, but I mean, I only had a couple of million in the bank and then that was, that was enough to pass you over that threshold. Everything goes from being a red light to like, you know, this royal highway, everything opens up for you. And, you know, everything in terms of flights and you, you don't, like you say, they, they, they don't do passports. They don't, you know, like Bill Gates and these guys, they're not going to be doing showing QR codes to go into the venues they go to. It just doesn't work that way. So the, the rules are for you. It's not, uh, you know, the, continually liberals I think, tend to think, you know, that, oh, we're all in this together. We're all equal and they all apply to us. And then they ooh and ah when they find out that, you know, some of these guys did a transgression. But it's like, the, the world doesn't, uh, they're not under the same law that we, we're under. Yeah, the rule of law is an illusion. It, it only is a story that we tell everybody to think that it's equally applied so that, that we don't get uh, upset about it being unequally applied. But it, it's, it's absolutely, uh, countries break their own laws as a matter of course um, when it comes to, yeah, we're just going to uh, blame the the uh, we need to make sure that we can break our own laws so that we can find the few pedophiles among us or something. But then they use it for political will, or they use it for um, you know encroachment on uh, you know industrial espionage and that kind of thing. Well, well, yeah. This this is a hugely important point because the I don't think a lot of people know that the 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 bottom of the social structure. Uh, you know what? What maybe nice people would call the criminal classes? They they don't obey the law. They they're not subject to the law. They're doing their own shit. Uh, and then the very top, they're doing their own shit. So it's only the masses of the bourgeois, and it, they kind of like the sheep that everybody is feeding on. So the law applies to the the middle classes, and they you know scrupulously attentive to obeying the law. But uh, the the rich and the poor don't obey the law. They they, um, they they go their own way. The rich, um, you know, and they, they kind of have a mutual respect for each other. But I'll give you an example in case you think I'm being a bit too hyperbolic. But I I, I once had to do a bit of software for, um, you know, the, it was a kind of an AI thing for uh, uh, finding which uh, tickets and um, airline tickets were actually fraudulent. And I find because I've been doing this work. I find out and which the shared these uh, you know airlines they shared information that that there's masses of tickets. I mean it's something like thirty percent of all, of all flights tickets sold are done fraudulently. In other words, they're not the actual person. They're somebody flying under an assumed name because they're a criminal or they've done with a stolen credit card and stuff. So it's it's really seventy percent of the, the, the airlines are very keen that you don't know this. And the reason yep. is because they expose that seven of the people are so profitable they cover the the crooks the you know thirty percent crooks that are flying next to you on the plane, and so so basically it's thieves stealing from thieves and they kind of have this mutual respect. So the airlines kind of respect all these guys that are doing you know flying under the radar. I'm sorry, literally, um, and um, they they don't prosecute them too hard. They try and identify them. But they know full well as if it becomes public knowledge, they're just as crooked as as the crooks. So they they, they go, and the same applies to credit cards. Credit cards defaults and uh, credit card 
crime, identity theft, is absolutely epidemic all over the world. But they, the banks as well, the retail uh, credit card holders, and they, they don't um, credit uh, lenders. They don't, they don't want the public to know that because the scam is that all the, the predatory pricing and urshery that they're doing for, for credit card debt is, is such a ripoff. It's a basically a payday loan scheme. And so the fact that like 50% of card transactions are, are bogus, uh, they like, shh, don't let everybody know that. Otherwise, the 50% that we're all looking at. So you're having the very poor guys doing identity theft and stealing all these people's um, wealth. And, and it's kind of, you know, then you have the big guys doing the same. And they both have this kind of uh, gentleman's agreement agreement amongst thieves that we, we don't uh, upset the apple cart. So yeah, now let, that you brought it up, I think we should... <laughs> I think we should have a little public service announcement. The the bag tags that that you have on your uh, luggage, and as well as pictures of your your tickets and things like that that you'd post on Instagram or whatever, um, those can uh, get all your personal information. Uh, there's a lot of really easy scans that can be done on that. Um, and the 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 system that you're talking about, um, one of the major ones is called Saber, which does the um, the reservations for airlines that's, and things like that. That's what I was working on. Was I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to say it. <laughs> well, you, you didn't have to say it. I, I'll say it. Um, the the uh, uh, that system is pre-internet, so it it had to. When you think about it, it had to be a global network of uh, to, to coordinate, you know, delayed flights and that kind of thing. Um, and so this is way old. Um, uh, stuff on uh, mainframes that uh, is just, it's too expensive to fix and it is woefully insecure. It is just a joke. Um, what, uh, and that they're unable to fix it because the system's working um, and it would cost, you know, billions of dollars to fix. So um, we just live with the insecurity. And that's just kind of a theme of the entire technical. Uh, system is that it's it's all fundamentally insecure and dangerous. Oh, oh, but just 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 let me highlight that is. Do you know who the biggest the amount of you know everybody thinks oh you know the credit card theft is somebody that sits next to you on the plane and you know when you fall asleep they steal your bag and take it to the uh, the toilets and like take photographs of your credit cards and others like no the the vast majority. Are the guys in call centers and uh, guys at EPOS stations and stuff, and they asking your details. They are saying, you know, oh, you know, <laughs> what's the security code on the back of your credit card? Give me this and give me that. And what do you think they're going to do? They're paid minimum wage. They're going to go and fucking sell it on the dark web for Christ's sake. What, what else would they do? And so uh, the, the vast majority of these things. So, so for example, like on Saber, since, since you mentioned it, is. It, you know, if you're bored and you're a flight attendant or, a, you know, some checkout thing in some place in you know, Lagos, uh, the amount of shit that you can find on anybody just by typing in on a passenger. Um, and then, you know, the, the very thing, that kind of thing that I was working on is anti-fraud thing. They tie up with so much other information that anybody working on those systems effectively has the eyes of God. That that's the important part of AI too. Is everybody thinks well? The government is looking at no. The government is individual people like cops, and you know these are the cops who just fucking we've just seen a rash of them. You know, basically being serial killers. The and the, the way they get away with it is because they know the system and they're inside. But imagine how much power an average cop has. That like you know you 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 next door neighbor to a cop. And you know he doesn't like your dog barking or something like that. You know what shit he can do to you? He can fucking ruin your life. And it's yeah. it's basically he has the power of the state. In so the 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 possibility for abuse and theft, identity theft, and and just it's just extreme. And all these liberals think, well, it's keeping me safe. I don't have anything to hide, so therefore I don't have anything to worry about. Are you fucking kidding? <laughs> <laughs> You've just yeah, you don't have anything to hide. Stuff. Please give me all your passwords, uh, and I will hold them for you. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. In the, you think all these passwords are secure? Well, I can tell you they passed through a dozen servers in Open Tech before they ever get encrypted. You think that some programmer can't take them down? It's like 
Uh, like, I mean, I, uh, you don't see it so much now, but I, I once got in one system and went to the supervisor. I showed him everybody's password in the entire company. And the, it was just held uh, basically in one place. It was just XOR. That's the only <laughs> It just XOR the bed screen. That was the only security. <laughs> Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's like, anyway, I hope we're shattering people's confidence um, in A, that the system actually works. The system is massively inefficient. It's just waterlogged and sclerotic and barely coping. Um, and the, one of the reasons why it chugs along so merrily is because no one knows. No one exposes it. Everybody thinks that this is powerful and it works and it's indomitable. So, no, it's the most corrupt, inefficient thing you could possibly imagine. It's, I'm just staggered that it works. I'm, I'm, every time I get on a plane, I'm not, I, I'm not like every other people, like, oh, this is fucking plane is late. I'm like, my fucking God, this thing got in the air. You know what the chances of that is? It's like, if you know the systems, the AKS systems, everything that has to be done, the, you know, now you're starting to see it because you're seeing the JIT systems fail, you're seeing supply shocks and stuff. And now you can start to see that <laughs> how the system ever worked for so long is just a miracle of people propping it up. It's millions yeah. and millions of people that are propping it up and 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 um, you know ma making it fail safe. But you know you take those people if people defect, and that's what's happening now, is people are just pissed off and they're giving up their jobs and stuff. But you see, if the average person, the goody two Jews, little Ned Flanders that keep the system, if they defect. Oh man, the system, you know, your planes will won't get off the ground. Yeah, I I don't know that I mean, is there any time in history when when the Ned Flanders is, have defected? Yeah, all the time. In fact, that's pretty much the you know, the strategy for um IB and XR and all of that is um it, it's uh, revolutionaries try to get um, the bourgeois to turn. That's the main thing. But I mean, uh, you know, essentially Gandhi got it. All revolutions they turn. But I mean, yeah, the 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 most the most fabulous example of it is Ceausescu. So the you know essentially just in one afternoon during a speech, some guy booed and the whole house came down. It, but booing to you know, in the street to a Ceausescu speech was pretty much take, you know, they'd take you away and that you'd disappear. So to, to boo was a very, very, um, you know, very subversive thing to do and dangerous. Oh. But some guy did it and the whole crowd suddenly, <laughs> suddenly was with him and it started booing. And so it's, okay. uh, you know, Ceausescu didn't under, last a day after that. From my understanding that, uh, that's the public story of of things like that where uh oh in egypt you know the um uh, mubarak was you know ushered away by the the masses who revolted against him and the truth is that that's the military um stepping aside letting you do that right so uh I, yes so damn it. i knew you ryan i knew you were gonna call me on that i was hoping you wouldn't but yeah, you're right. So uh, the Ceausescu thing was all done behind the scenes, but still, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just pushing, <laughs> pushing this story <laughs> for propaganda effect. Yeah, I, underneath it all, yeah, it's all a big scam. But I didn't, I didn't want you to call. <laughs> Sorry for popping the bubble. The Ceausescu there. thing was a big scam. You see, what 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 happened was in the Ceausescu thing. Since you called me on it, I'll explain it. The the guys knew that Ceausescu was getting weak. Um, so the second tier upper up apparatchiks, again, we were talking about this as captain's revolutions, is those guys are kind of in, frustrated insiders. So uh, what happens in an officer class is, okay, you have all the, the rank and file, which is like our society. Um, then you have guys that make it, you know, a few million, then they kind of become officers and then they, eats in the officer's mess. They don't mingle with you anymore. Surprisingly low bar. Um, and then in the officer class, there's normally a divide right right, right around, um, you know, the, the 30s, 30 year olds, uh, that kind of thing. So the captains, normally captains in the military by that stage. And, and what those guys are, are they know the system well and they fed up 
they are still young bloods, young Turks, and they're kind of fed up with the old guard. Uh, but they can't do anything about the, the old guard. Um, and so, uh, but they're looking for their chance all the time. And they're good administrators. They're more capable. They're smarter. They're more youthful. They're more to, you know, cognizant and intelligent to get. And so they uh, say in the case of Ceausescu, those guys, they know they can manage the machine without all these old guys. And so um, they look for their chance and then they, they organize it so that they take down those the old guys and then they step in. And that's what happened in Egypt and in um, and, and in uh, um, uh, what's in um, Romania. But um, the uh, what happened in Romania is then those guys became oligarchs and they took over and then it's just a, you know they just become the new landlords. But it's a it's a palace coup, and that, this is this is a problem with the strategy for IB and stuff like that. Is unless you in with those that guy, the, that class of guys, they will use you to do the revolution their revolution um, and then you know just like the Islamic Brotherhood and stuff in Egypt they're waiting in the wings and then they you know they they have the levers um, of power they just don't have already to in the way they they do and that, that's how coups generally happen so but yeah in terms of popular things I can point you to like the white lotus so, so generally a, a lot of these things are the guys um, from the bottom are, are farmers, and um, in, in our case, it would be white collar workers. So you, you'd get uh, more and more people to, to just become lawless and start doing hacking and you know, stuff. White collar workers have a tremendous opportunity for, for wrecking. Yeah, I suppose um, the other examples in history, I was thinking about, um, there's been a lot of people referencing uh, in relation to, you know, the road to currency collapse. The, in the 1700s in France, the Assignon um, and the run up to that, you know, the Mississippi bubble, and then you had John Law and he issued the Assignon. And then I think they issued another one and then people just didn't trust that. And then they issued the, is it the something Mari maritime unitaire? Oh, I can't remember the name. It was a French name, another currency, and it lasted literally months. People were just like, nah, like they weren't buying it anymore. And then apparently that, a lot of scholars say that led directly to the French Revolution. Um, I would need to read a bit more about that, but there's a few guys on the, you know, the gold bugs are talking a lot about that now. Um, Alistair McLeod keeps referencing it, and he's like everything that's happening now in the financial, you know, world. All this crazy financialization and QE is a dead ringer for this Mississippi bubble. By John Law. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm in that school. I mean, I'm in that school. I definitely agree with that. That led to the French Revolution, and I and I think they bang on that. That's exactly what it is. History is repeating itself now. But there's a few details in that which are important lessons and cautionary tales. So, so John Law in the Mississippi bubble was, uh, just for people that don't know, John Law was a Scotsman who became Minister of Finance um, for Louis XIV, I guess. Uh, but uh, he, he, in other words, uh, did pretty much what... He's kind of the Alan Greenspan of the... <laughs> Of his time, and um, the the Mississippi bubble was the a, a, a stock bubble that just just like the stock exchange today uh, inflated massively, and John Law had to disappear in the night. Uh, but before John Law left uh, office, he he did uh, something which was crucial for the history of the world, and that was uh, he set up the first central bank. So wh what happened after that? Um, was uh, that the, that was replicated in Britain with the Bank of England and then eventually in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Bank. But in, in essence, the whole system from John Law on has been run by those central bankers. And the very first thing that happened, um, the, the, what was more impactful than this, the, the French Revolution was it led to the Seven Years' War. So this, this, the Seven Years' War 
was the First World War. Uh, so Churchill called it the First World War. And it, it was definitely the first war that was global. Um, and so the, um, now the reason for that, the war, if you look closely for the reasons, it's clearly the financiers. They made a huge packet out of it. And the, the reason why America was formed was because after the Seven Years' War, it was all done on debt by, you know, basically bondage. Again, writing contract. So they, um, uh, when the Seven Years' War was finished, it was, uh, you know, the reason why you know it's the financiers because they finance both sides. They finance both France and, and Britain and Prussia and Russia. They financed all, all the sides. So, you know, they would be treasonous if they were pa patriotic uh, or had the national interest at heart. But what they did, then um, after that is they said, okay, and war's over. Now we come to collect all the fucking interest. And uh, the colonies, um, uh, George Washington and the, that crowd, George Washington was the richest um, landowner in the colonies. So they, you know, knew that the colonies were going to be taxed to the bone to pay for the Seven Years' War. And so the reason for American independence was they said, like, fuck you, we do, we, we, you're not going to extract um, tax out of us to pay for the Seven Years' War. That's the, that's the primary cause of, of independence, which is, is lost now. They never, historians never tell you about the finances because that's the real meat and potatoes of what's going on. And they don't want you to know. Yeah. But anyway, you know, somebody's got more to say about that. It's very important now because we're about to go to war again. So if you follow that playbook, I think we should discuss the coming war. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? I know, because we, I think we had we talked enough this morning about the. Oh, there's a problem with my sound. Do you hear me? Yeah, it's, there's an echo. There's an echo. I, I'll just do something. Um, sorry. Oh, I, no, that's, suddenly it's good. Suddenly it's good. Okay. Yeah, suddenly it's good. Um, no, what I mean is that um, we we were talking this morning. What I was going to say is that we're talking so much about AI and it, this morning and intelligence. I think we should leave it for another day. And, yeah, I would be very interested to, to hear about that because it's always at the back. We were actually talking about it with Mike before before the meeting. And... Uh, yeah, cause I'm, 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 I'm pl I have plenty to learn in that line. <laughs> yeah, so in the light of all of that, I've, I've been telling people now that, you know, you must start preparing for war because the way I see it is war is unavoidable. We're barreling headlong into war. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, reasons, the reasons for it are financial. Well, I mean, it's... It's economics, but the uh, I don't think that war can be avoided um, just because of the, the system as it's been set up. So it's really a consequence of Bretton Woods. And so the financial system that was set up after World War II uh, has set us up for World War III. Um, and, the, and it was the the American architects, you, we know them by name because they sat down with um, people like John Maynard Keynes and worked out Bretton Woods and the Bretton Woods system. And um, yeah, uh, Maynard Keynes said, if you do this, you will herald disaster. And what he meant by <laughs> disaster was essentially the, the system as it unfolded and, and World War III, um, which is where we're at now. So. To, to simplify it vastly um, and to explain to you why I think uh, we're heading for wars, uh, people will tell you all sorts of shit um, because you've got to, un to understand what's really happening. You understand, have to understand. And so a historian will tell you crap and a military historian will tell you crap and uh, you know, so an economist will tell you a little bit and stuff. But uh, if you piece everything together, it works something like this. It, I, the quickest way to explain it is that what they set up at Bretton Woods was a Ponzi scheme. So America has been running a Ponzi scheme, and the way it worked was they 
agreed with Saudi Arabia. Everybody needs oil. So they, they had the Bitter Lake Agreement, even in 1945, Roosevelt met uh, King Saud and they set up this, this system. What it said was, you can only sell oil for, do for dollars. So um, uh, the same with Iran and, you know, they kind of got buy-in from French Mobile and uh, BP. And, but any, anyway, they managed to have it that uh, oil was uh, sold in, in dollars. Now, the whole point of that was that f that enslaved the rest of the world, in effect, because everybody needs oil and uh, it becomes a de facto currency. So if, you, if you're a country um, other than Saudi Arabia, you have to do um, some business with, with America, uh, sell some goods to America, in a, and so you can get dollars. And you need those dollars so you can go and buy, you know, pe petrodollars so you can go and buy oil on the, um, on the open market, and, you know, everybody needs energy. Um, the deal that they made with Saudi Arabia was then Saudi Arabia would would only allow be allowed to buy. I mean, they could spend a, a bit on themselves buying fast cars and jets and hookers and stuff. But then, they, what they had to do was um, buy assets in America. That was the deal. So they couldn't buy corporations or industry or start to eat up. America that way, they particularly had to buy a treasury. So in other words, government debt bonds. And so now here, here you can see what's what's happening is everybody has to go and sell cheap shit to America to get dollars. Uh, that's the only way they can get oil. And then the Saudis have to go and buy treasuries, which in essence are a promissory note with a, a small interest rate, which the, the government sets. But they can set it any way they like, so because you know the Saudis have to buy them. So I hope you see what they've just done. If you see this little loop, what it means is they're getting goods from all over the world for free, right? They've set up this little system where, you know, ultimately you need oil. Then basically we funnel that through the Saudis. The Saudis then go and buy paper, and so in essence they just doing goods for paper. So, you see, now, the reason they did this was in the old days, they used to do goods for gold. America had three quarters of the world's gold at that stage. But, you see, what everybody else had done was uh, like the, the Spanish Empire. The Spanish Empire was ruined by gold and silver, particularly silver. Because the Spanish galleons came back to Spain, and all the silver essentially went straight to China. Uh, basically, with China, they had silks and exotic goods, that the uh, luxury items that flooded into Spain. The net effect was Spanish manufacturing, just like America now, got eaten up because labor was too expensive. Nobody would go down a mine. So, in essence, there was no manufacturing base left in Spain. Um, when the silver ran out, Spain had nothing. And so it was improper. And that's pretty much what America is today. So now, um, China. So, so in today's world now, you have to see that all these guys are running a Ponzi scheme. All of these fiat currencies are Ponzi scheme. It's, it's a promise to pay back shit that you're never going to pay back. So what, what they're doing is all these players are sitting around a card table. Now, you have to make, imagine Uncle Sam's got a bazooka. I mean, literally a fucking bazooka. You see, to, to run all of this, the reason why most countries can't run this scam is because they don't have a military. So it, it's really the, the power of the dollar is, is, comes from a barrel of a gun. Because if America actually you know, defaulted or something like that, nobody can come and say to them, like, okay, we're seizing you know, Florida. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but, but you owe it to us. Um, that's how it normally works on equal countries. But if somebody has a, the biggest military known man, then then they, you can't do that. So so most of the spending in America, government spending. Okay, the government spending is only three things: it's repayment on the na na, um, the national debt. That means the small interest payment that they give to the Saudis for the <laughs> for, for recycling the petrodollars into treasuries. Um, then the other thing is uh, social security and Medicare, which they hate and try to get rid of it. 
and then the military. That's all there is, just three things. That's all the government does. And the military is there to keep the whole system going. And so what it means is that you have to imagine, you know, there's Pooh Bear, uh, all the players, all the players sitting around this card table playing poker. Uh, America's losing, and deliberately, all the chips are now going over to China. So there's Pooh Bear. His chips are growing and growing and growing. Uh, but Uncle Sam has a bazooka on his shoulder pointed right at Pooh Bear. So you know exactly how this card game is going to go up. And in fact, Pooh Bear is playing this very, very badly. There's, he doesn't have much choice because really what he should be doing is impoverishing himself so he can slip out the door. But if, if you imagine you're held hostage in this you know, saloon in this wild west scene, you know what's going to happen is you know, the, the Pooh Bear is going to accumulate all the chips. He's, he's got a gun next to him and he has to reach for the gun at some stage. Otherwise, he can't get out the door with all the, the chips. And Uncle Sam is going to wait until he's got out of chips. Then he needs Pooh Bear to reach for his gun so that he can blow him away. And that's the situation we're in. So well, I just I hope that... Yeah? That, that's true to some degree. So in the conventional warfare arena, the U.S. has an enormous amount of firepower to bring to bear. Um, however, that kind of conventional warfare is kind of, um, you know, we're, we're in a new new era where that's, you know, mainly for um, positioning and um, political maneuver. Um, whereas with, um, it's kind of like back in the day of, of piracy where privateers would be hired by, you know, the governments that didn't want to openly declare war, but they wanted to, you know, the British wanted to smash the Spanish galleons, and so they would, like, hire hire out the privateers to go take care of them. Um, a lot of the, the cyber warfare is, um, you know, it's very uh, difficult to trace or easy to make it look like it's coming from somewhere else, and, and so, um, you know, how do you deploy an army against that? Like when you get attacked and, and you... Uh, so, so it's, it's not. They have to have a nuclear war. So, so here's, here's a bit of background that one of the pieces people don't get. Because they so... You see, the, the public and uh, the non-governmental and non-military sector has talked themselves into this uh, dangerous bit of bullshit about nuclear war. And so what, what it is in essence is... It was encouraged by the Soviets and uh, agitprop and things like that, but the CNB was badly infiltrated by communists, and they they told the you know the population they they terrified. You see, Russia during the Cold War, the first Cold War, they they ha had um, uh, a nuclear deficit. So so America put all its 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 uh, chips on the table as nuclear because they couldn't match the tank manufacturing and stuff that, that Russia had. So the, what Russia did in return was did things like the CND to scare the crap out of the population about nuclear. Now that uh, didn't, it, it worked well because uh, the public now in America and Europe has this fixated idea that if, if nuclear war starts, it's binary. The first bomb that drops, well, it's game over. That's the end of the planet. They had this, you know, five easy pieces movie. They literally had people, the serious academics that wrote complete horseshit. Like if nuclear war started, the world, the planet would be split in two or into five pieces. And it's absolute hogwash. It's absolute hogwash. Now, why this is dangerous is it almost demands that we will have a nuclear war. And the reason is that America, okay, first of all, let me paint the picture, the true picture, and the picture that is in the heads of the military planners. So in, in their heads, they know the truth. And then the truth is that nuclear weapons are on a sliding scale. There's no such thing as, oh, nuclear war breaks out, end of civilization. It's just a sliding scale that goes all the way from pepper spray to, you know, for protesters on the street all the way to um, the, um, hydrogen bombs. So they, 
it's a spectrum all the way so that and there's the bogeyman of nuclear war is entirely in the public's head. It's not in the military's head. So, for example, they, you know, they have conventional weapons that are much bigger than some of the nuclear weapons. Now, that seems weird to you because you, you think of, you know, all these you know, nuclear weapons, ICBMs. So, no, I mean, I, I work with a guy who I told you had a, his job was to take a, a, a nuclear bomb the size of a football in a backpack into, you know, when the Russians came streaming into Germany, he was stationed in Germany. His job was to go into the middle of a tank battalion and, you know, leave his bomb and try and make a getaway and, or, or otherwise commit suicide if, if necessary. So you have, you know, a bomb this, this, this size. You have bombs the size of, of, a, of, a, of a shell. You know, they, they actually have artillery weapons with, you know, bombs. They have torpedoes and stuff. So, so, so if there's a war, say, over, you know, in the South China Sea, one of the primary first uses of a nuclear weapon would be against fleets. You, they would try to take out the carriers because carriers are very well defended. You can try and just swamp them with nuclear weapons. So, so here's the reason why it's very dangerous that this part the public doesn't know this, because since Vietnam, the America has uh, basically run off this idea of psyops that psyops and leave. So they know now that after Vietnam they were beaten by a superior side. So the the, the after Quino and stuff wrote these papers and set up. Um, this thing for, you know, um, mind war and, and things like that. Then uh, one of the key things that came out of that was shock and awe. And shock and awe was used in, um, in, in Iraq and it worked. So you can bet that they're going to double down on it. But you see, look at the shock and awe value of a nuclear weapon. Is if, uh, if you think in terms of this card cable, table where, you know, they need Pube to make a reach for his gun so they can blow him away. Um, that, that's very easily accomplished. I mean, Taiwan could just declare independence and, and China would, would attack and that would give them an excuse to, to start a nuclear war. But in, in a lot of ways, America has to start a nuclear war and it would win it. You see, the, the, the thing is that I think it would win it quite easily, in fact. And the reason is because most of the public, and I correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, but I think the same as in China, that if nuclear weapons went off, uh, China in particular would think, oh, we fucked up, we're doomed. And they would win merely on the psychological um, aspect. So, so um, in terms of you know, how a, a, a nuclear war un unfolds is, uh, is very much with the fleets and stuff. But I mean, you would expect they would put uh, nuclear weapons on like Three Gorges Dam and stuff. China is very, very vulnerable to uh -huh. to that kind of first strike. So, so you, I think you they see are China... vulnerable to some degree, but the um, the the attitude uh, is this this long standing attitude since Mao about uh, we are fine to throw you know a billion people under the bus just to maintain our state. So uh, we don't care if you bomb us. Go for it. We'll bomb you worse. Um, and it's uh, the U.S. is a bunch of crybabies, and they will fold un under that kind of pressure. Yeah, I, I agree. So what? But so, but uh, do you see how it almost mandates war, unavoidable war, because America uh, has all its power in nuclear, and it has to win decisively with a nuclear first strike. For Puba, the 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 wealth is again like it's kind of like Russia. It's basically the is manpower. It's like what a, a few million people in the army now, and so four men I think or something is like in the in the army in China. And so the, so they have to make it a long grinding war that America can't do. But well, um, America so but as long as America can take it nuclear quickly, it can end it quickly too. I, I don't think that it ends the war though. That's the thing. So in, in every sim simulation that I've I've heard of that the U.S. military has done, um, it, where they have any kind of ground war engagement or uh, anything like that, in every scenario, the U.S. loses against China. 
Um, and it's there, there's just not a way to to do that. If it's a it's a, if it's a pure nuclear strike, it just uh, I mean you can hobble some industries and things like that. But China has a bunch of cities that are underground. They have a bunch of ways to to make um, their their infrastructure resilient to that kind of attack. Um, and uh, I think. Uh, most of this is actually going to be more of a, a soft power battle. Um, uh, the 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 hot war scenario, I, I think, is uh, it's something I'm very concerned about, uh, obviously. But um, it's also something that I think the you know the U.S. knows. Uh, you'd have to get a dumb person to do to to pull that trigger, right? And and. Uh, we have no shortage of those. So, but but I think strategically, no, just, just short sided. First. Yeah, just, just short sided. So so okay. So a couple of a couple of things. The um, the the those kind of things like reports of that kind of stuff is psyops. It's bullshit. So about you know U.S. loses everything like that. So they, one of the things they exclude is all their secret weapons. And so you can easily see that China would be wiped out to the last person. And they just do weather modification. So if, if they can time it so that it's uh, the correct uh, time for the monsoon or something like that, if they dump enough weapons um, in, in China, you can basically make a, a nuclear winter, change the monsoon. There's, you know that they're thinking this way because uh, in 2018, they drafted almost 2 million people. Uh, they got top security clearances for people in NOAA. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the weather uh, organization. So you know that that's the way they're thinking. Um, and so uh, they, they, I think there are enough secret weapons in the arsenal that they, they would make it uh, decisive. But the, um, in terms of, um, yeah, they, they, it can't be a soft war. And the reason is it's, we don't, they know, and we know that we don't have the luxury of time. In essence, if you go back to the financial causes and the trade war and financial war, uh, and all these things converging, the ecological crisis and the climate crisis, is they're all running a Ponzi scheme. And we, we're really in a resource war. So um, the China has all too, too, too many of the strategic materials and rare earth minerals. So they, they kind of have to, because if they run it too long, A, China will get parity or exceed America in nuclear capability, in, in which, which, you know, that means Uncle Sam can't use his bazooka anymore. Pooh Bear will have a bazooka at the other end of the table, uh, which they cannot allow. And if they run it too long, then you'll run into uh, climate change problems. So the climate change problems are coming on fast, and they're not sharing that with the public. But in terms of things like drought and crop failures and that, they have, well, the crops are actually increasing in America, and they probably will, um, but uh, for one or two more years. But the end of water is, is coming. And uh, so they, we all know that we're heading for collapse. So if, if you, you see, liberals think it's all, you know, they get stuck in this zone of politics. You see, that this is the problem is, it, it's so multifaceted that people, you know, are not very good at telling the future. One, one reason is because their, their desires and fears get in the way of what they're actually looking at, so their objectivity. So they lose objectivity because they don't want something to happen. They lose objectivity because this is their knowledge base. They have a knowledge base, say, I've done economics for so, and I can tell you that blah, 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 and stuff. And then they're missing. Well, that was, doesn't take into account climate change. Then climate change people and, and stuff can tell you all of that. But there are very few people see it the way a planner in the Pentagon sees it. And you're seeing the limits to growth. You're seeing the end of these resources, particularly things like fresh water. You see the need to actually do geoengineering. And you can easily see them rapidly coming towards something which hasn't been hit since 1965, as long as I've been alive. It hasn't been hidden that the way they see the final Armageddon 
and literally a lot of these guys are Mormons and stuff and do see this as Armageddon. Don't make a mistake about this. There's a lot, a lot more fucked up as business as usual and, and you know, the, the liberal narrative of what people would do and which would be crazy and mutually assured destruction. That's all horseshit. A lot of these guys are actually fundamentalist Christians and they see this as Armageddon. So don't, don't, don't discount crazy. So, the, uh, but anyway, uh, if you put all of these together in a bag, you can easily see that they, they do, you know, geoengineering with nuclear weapons. You cool down the climate very easily. You run a few models, is you wipe out China's crops, you make famine, you nuke them into, you know, into submission, you make a flood in the, the Yalu River. You, you see, think about, you see, it's very dangerous to get into this mindset of, oh, they would never do that because, you know, they couldn't guarantee that nuclear, you know, U.S. cities wouldn't be struck. Now, that's not the way these guys think. That's the way liberals think and people on TV think and talking heads think. The way it really works is they would be prepared to lose American cities. There may be all 50 of them. You see, because... Where they're looking in, in terms of the end of end of growth, where this all winds up, is you really want to wind up with a planet of about 500 million people. So you have to look at it in a broad scale and see it in terms of their um, doomsday kind of thing that we're heading to kind of the end times. Now. And so I okay, can't so see that there's no void. There are too many things. There are too many problems it solves going down that route. I agree. I, yeah, I think you definitely... Like that analysis is definitely plausible. I, I think it's. But my question is, um, where does where does Russia and North Korea and countries like that? Because as much as they may have like their wishes to plan this, okay, yeah, they're probably mad and crazy, as you're saying. Are you saying that um, they would have done some backroom deal with Putin, or well, I mean, they would be on the phones, wouldn't they, if they're going to just about to launch something, but what stops it escalating and then we've just got nothing left because they go and launch all their nukes and you end up in some complex spiral of, well, like they projected back when the RAND Corporation, all these people were figuring it out back in the 70s, how it would escalate. I mean, you can't just discount Russia and all these other countries that have nukes, can you? Yeah, so, so it's, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated world, but... The important thing that I want to try and convey to you, if nothing else, is uh, don't get into this liberal idea, which um, is, you know, it's uh, the pro progressive millenarian thing where you think, oh, it all spirals into chaos and then the end. No, they don't, they don't do that. Military planners don't go, and then, you know, they never finish your report or analysis or do modeling that says, and then it all goes to shit. <laughs> it's like, I'm telling you, military reports do not end that way. They go in details exactly what is left at the end of it. And I'm telling you, in a lot of the, you, you see, if you look at something like the Rockefeller Foundation and the uh, Council on Foreign Relations and those, the, their kind of projections of these scenarios, is particularly the one that stands out for me is the, the Ford Fo Foundation or no, Rockefeller Institute. Uh, the one where they had all these different five different scenarios. We're in the one, the lockstep one. Now, uh, an average liberal would say that this this is a disaster because it's uh, you know there's a lot of unrest on the streets, there are pandemics, there are wars, and 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 so it's saying like why are we on that trajectory? And was, well, there's a key line in it that says this one the government keeps control. The other nice one, which was you have you know universal government and. UBIs and rainbows and unicorns, and we you know, work together to bring to you that is the, the centralized planning and governments would have to disappear. And so they, you can see why that we've gone down the lockstep one. Uh, but anyway, I just want to say that the, the, at, at the end, we go into, you know, as civilians and stuff, we go into, and then whoa, the world falls apart and we've lost liberal democracy. Oh, then, so obviously we'd never go there. No, <laughs> you're a liberal Democrat. The guys that are doing these plannings are not liberal Democrats, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and, a, and a lot of them, like Pompeo and stuff, they have copies of Mein Kampf secretly in, under their pillows, right? So, so, 
okay, the, if you're going to guess where all this goes down is, is kind of all of the above, you wouldn't ever, ever get an insight. But the way the Cold War is set up is that it's, um, you know, North Korea, Pakistan, uh, China, Iran, Russia on one side. Um, but, you know, I, th I mean, I would guess that Putin's playing everybody off against everybody else. And I wouldn't be surprised if they'd give him a phone call and warn him that, you know, that I think he would know anyway, because it's probably the thing that's liable to do it is a invasion of Taiwan. Then they would say, look, we're going to nuke him, nuke him. And Russia would, would, would stand down saying, okay, let America and China fight it out and uh, we'll be supreme at the end of it. I'm pretty sure that's what, what Putin thinks, but in, in, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a weak alliance. Um, it's a uh, I, I, the weak alliance I, I on believe, that side. Uh, I believe Putin has recently uh, backed China for Taiwan. He has actually said that yeah, Taiwan. Yeah, is no, they, they are aligned. They are aligned. It's just a, it's just um, an alliance of convenience. That's the the thing. Is uh, you know, the, is how, you know, I mean, China and Russia have been to war in the nineteen sixties. We're talking tank war, so they they're not great lovers of each other right so they, they're not um they're not compadres in in that way they uh they have a, a marriage of convenience right so how deep does it go I mean, you, you know okay, the treatments exactly. out for Putin, right? <laughs> okay and then and then of course we have the problem of north korea which i mean trump went some way to start talking to which was interesting that was actually one of the the interesting things that Trump did. And I don't know, it was just, obviously it's all facade, but that was something that no other president had done, wasn't it? And um, to go and talk to little Kim. Yeah. But yeah, well, I mean, see, North Korea is a bit of a messy one. I mean, you know, well, what would they do there? Because I mean, North Korea are kind of, I mean, there's a part, there's a sort of a partnership between North Korea and China, isn't there? I mean, they kind of China puts North Korea in its place every now and again, doesn't it? I yeah, think. but yeah. but China needs North Korea to not collapse because then it has a major migration crisis of you know unskilled people just flooding everywhere um, that it couldn't sustain. So it wants North Korea to stay uh, isolated and uh, keep its problems inside its borders. Um, the the uh, an interesting story about uh, North Korea that almost no American knows is uh, Kim Il Sung, the founder of North Korea. Um, uh, he traced his um, his great grandfather back to, or maybe it's just his grandfather, to uh, to an event that we never learned in school, which is uh, similar to how Commodore Matthew Perry took the um, you know the gunboats to Japan and said, uh, "Open up." Um, for unequal trade or we'll come back and burn all your cities in one year. Uh, we did the same thing with with uh, Korea. We went up the up the river with our gunboats and said, hey, we want all your stuff. Um, uh, this is a shakedown. And um, uh, there was a, the General Sherman incident. So the, the gunboat was called the General Sherman and it got lodged on a sandbar. And these Korean villagers uh, streamed in and burned it down. Um, and the leader of that pack of uh, villagers uh, was, um, you know, Kim Il-sung traced, he said that that was his grandfather. It's so important to them and their mythology for, uh, for to, to be, you know, uh, in, a, in opposition to um, the, the colonial powers that that, that was, um, you know, really a, a part of his uh, founding narrative. Uh, of his of his cult of personality. Oh, that's but interesting. Yeah. I didn't know. We, we we the the U.S. were were the you know evil aggressors in <laughs> many 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 times over. Yeah, but oh, just one more thing that I was thinking of here is is uh, getting into simple scenarios about who would win a nuclear war and stuff is like uh, that that you know and how how much bullshit there is in that is uh, one of the big, uh, I would say one of the crucial factors, and one of the things timing when war will come is uh, the cyber war that's been going on, and particularly, you know, the chip uh, war. So that the, 
the the chips are compromised. You you clearly see um, that each uh, the nuclear stockpiles are are compromised in terms of they're hacked. Yeah. Um, um, and how badly they're hacked is extraordinary. So for example, like if you're talking about North Korea, uh, a missile went into Pyongyang. One of the test missiles went into Pyongyang and into the suburbs and killed a few people. Well, that's almost definitely hacked. That's almost definitely hacked by by the by U.S. and Israel. And they, and what what they normally do in that kind of hack is turn the missiles against you know back on its target. So, the a lot of these uh, you know reverse engineer technologies and things that that China's got in terms of torpedoes and missiles and stuff, they will turn back on a submarine. So uh, um, if they, the, a lot of this technology that does uses GPS and location finding, if it determines that it's like suddenly going at you know three times the speed of sound or something, uh, it will instantly turn itself back to its target. It'll and so they 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 struggling to get clean chipsets, but uh, the chip shortage is nothing to do with COVID. Don't believe that. The chip shortage started before COVID, and as far as I can tell, is it's they're trying to get clean chips. Now, the reason I think for that is so that they can go to war. But as soon as they've got a clean chipset, in other words, in about two years, you can expect war. So, because every everything's kind of converging on that. Yeah, in China. But you um, see, in, in uh, their minds, in their in their minds that you see, you might you see a conventional approach a talk it might say, oh, how many nuclear missiles does China have? How many does America have? You know, you know, and it's like no, it's nothing to do with that. It has to do with how much the guys in the Pentagon think that they have uh, in the cyber war. They can turn the missiles back on China, and how many they're going to actually take and intercept. And and there, there's so many weapons that you don't know about, like um, you know, particle beam weapons and stuff like that. A lot of the stuff that's done in Slack and the Large Hadron Collider. You think all that civilian research and you know, all they're finding the Higgs boson and the, it's like all that shit's dual use. I'll bet you anything that the, you know, the, the, the magnets and all that technology for boosting hadrons and focusing the beams and stuff is, is used in, um, you know, some way you'll find it deployed on a 747. And it's, it's all dependent on, you know, basically taking out ICBMs and, but all, all those things are, are factored into a massive, calculations that we're not privy to and so so i would i would think that if you look at the posture of america is that they have supremacy and they're losing it and they have to go to war and there has to be a nuclear war before um they lose supremacy so so uh poo is in a hopeless situation he's accumulating all the chips on the table he's walking down a barrel of a gun and any stack he can't. He can't get rid of his chips because otherwise, you know, it'll make China economically unstable if they stop growing economically. He he can't get to nuclear supremacy or or military supremacy without you know uh, evoking a Thucydian trap. So he's he's absolutely boxed in. I I can't see how we can escape war, and America has to do do it because otherwise, if you look at the future, if you run the future. Where, where the you see one of the things happening? Okay, if you go to the financial landscape, is what China is forcing is a de-dollarization. China, in effect, is is doing exactly what Saddam was doing, and many others, including people like Gaddafi. But China is trying to de-dollarize. Now, de-dollarization is it? De-dollarization is a new king, right there, mm -hmm. and try, China's kind of doing it. So they can't, they can't win. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, uh, that's that's part of the the, the proxy war with um, Russia with uh, Assad and stuff is it, all about that pipeline that, that Russia was building uh, through um, through there and uh, yeah to 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 regarding the yeah. the um, uh, the the GPS um, GPS in China is um, is intentionally broken, so uh, your phones uh, report your, uh, the the wrong location all the time, like randomly. So uh, you can use GPS, but it's wrong within you know a, 
a certain radius um, often uh, just because it's uh, a national security thing. It's the same in America. With the, it's the same with GLONASS, everything. So, the, yeah. so but China has, uh, uh, you know, everybody is putting up their, their own uh, positioning satellites. So they have their, their own network. The problem is, is, is all those networks compromised? So in other words, you know, when the war starts, is how how bad is the error for for, for military equipment? I mean, for uh, it gets switched off for mili for civilian, right? By yeah, the way, that, that, there's a little pointer for for you if you if you're a prepper is the GPM gets switched off day one, uh, and so you you um, it happened in the Gulf War. It happened in the first Gulf War. One of the first things that happened was they switched the <laughs> GPS system off. And so that'll happen again, and that's the reason why they invented GLONASS and why the Chinese system is, is rolling out for uh, global positioning. Um, but you see, they, they don't know that the chipsets and the software that they're using isn't compromised, so that um, you know, it'll, it'll start relocating all the American cities onto Chinese cities <laughs> and yeah. to thwart missiles and stuff. It's that yeah, bad. That's, you know? I, that's what they're they're actively trying to do is get uh, locally sourced chips uh, for everything. Um, and the, the, the US is trying to do that as well, um, struggling somewhat. Um, but both sides have each other's tech and each other's um, supply chain. Um, and it's kind of a, uh, Rush, uh, uh, a Roman generals thing of like, hey, I'm the more charismatic general. All of your troops are now mine. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> like. That kind of thing. All your base are ours. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, um, in terms of uh, um, yeah, I was uh, just one of the things you said. Uh, um, in terms of the chipsets, oh, lost the thread. Supply chain. Um, oh yeah, the supply chain. Yeah. So 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 one of the primary chip chip producers is Taiwan. So it. Um, it means that, uh, you know, in, in essence, there is a calculation for China to make, and that is um, how how much, uh, you know, semiconductors are is America reliant on from, from China and, and Korea yeah. and, um, and the Philippines. And so they, they could try and rush those <laughs> if they think it's going to be a long war, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um I, just for the the sake of the audience, um, to uh, I I want people to know that every chip that you have bought in the last fifteen years has been compromised. Um, th like the there are uh, smaller chips, like com full on computers inside each CPU um, that monitor and can ex remotely uh, view what's on your screen and can take over. This is called the Intel Management Engine, um, and AMD has something similar. Uh, there are companies like Purism um, that are trying to disable it, but they're, um, if you disable it, then your computer hard reboots every 30 seconds. So it's a, uh, it's a very difficult thing to, to get around. But uh, just know that um, with any kind of um, uh, a computer that you're using, that they're all, you, you cannot buy a non-compromised computer uh, commercially. They're, they're all, com they've all been compromised for decades. So don't think that you're safe on your own hardware and think that you own your computer. You don't. You're merely renting it <laughs> from... <laughs> And yeah. it, it's all sorts of levels. I mean, it's it's from the hardware. They they have uh, rogue rogue chips in the chipset. So they have um, uh, they have in the microcode. They have even an open source software. They have guys slipping in lines of code. And so yeah, in the Linux never... kernel, there's there's fucking backdoors and shit. It's like ridiculous. Yeah, the, the, there's also that uh, Turing Award lecture, uh, reflections on trusting trust. I think. Um, which is a, a very interesting take uh, where even if you have perfectly legitimate source code, um, you'd need a compiler to compile it. And 
you can hide, uh, you can put the vulnerability in the compiler. So when you see a certain kind of source code, it like puts a little backdoor in. Um, but then you can hide that. Uh, you can say, well, I have the source code for my compiler. And then you just hide it a layer deeper. And eventually, you can go so deep that no one can ever tell, <laughs> like unless you go bit by bit. Um, uh, and even then, uh, even then, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say, yeah. Yeah. Even then, if, if, if so, so yeah, if uh, validation software and that doesn't doesn't work, but yeah, just a bit of history from from my personal history. I worked for the biggest computer company, <laughs> and um, uh, one of the things I did was maintain um, this back level software that it 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 was a commercial software, but it was used by the U.S. military um, for various things, which I won't mention. <laughs> but very topical on this subject, and it was um, many many years out of date. So it was really uh, twenty years out of date, and uh, the U.S. military paid this big company. Um, to keep the software going because it was old, precisely because it was old. They don't like new technology because it can be compromised. But it was that software was all written in assembler code, so to get around the compiler pro program and so, uh, problems. Even even now, the um, the nuclear launch things in those nuclear launch facilities they are out of the seventies and. They deliberately so because there was less espionage, mm -hmm. and so they they dare not, um, you know, upgrade those things because they're they're so likely to be compromised. Right. It's a weird world. It's a weird yeah, world it's in Battlestar Galactica when they were fighting the the Cylons or whatever, they they made sure that their spaceships had no technology on them, <laughs> so that they couldn't be hacked. Analog everything. But this is. Yeah, but uh, but hang on, this is this is what uh, Bin Laden and these uh, you know this is standard fare. So so they found that Bin Laden and all these guys would exchange you know handwritten messages and yeah, that's that's the way uh, in general people have to operate. So here this is an important point, and I'd like to emphasize it is when people see all this tech uh, yeah, e tyranny coming down. The, the the tendency is to say, oh no, we boxed in. Oh well, no, we're defeated. How can you know this is coming from every angle for every aspect of our lives, and um, how you know how could we ever really rebel against this or even resist? So here's the thing: the way to see all this technology is kind of like nature's way of telling you you ought not to be doing this. So in other words, it's kind of like a memo from the universe saying, you know. Thou shalt not do this. It's a not a good thing to be doing. And so, it, once you, so for example, if if we tell you all this stuff about, say, the, how the airline industry and stuff is comp compromised, or they say, well, you can't fly unless you have, you know, a apartheid green pass and stuff like that. You're saying like, and then you go, oh, well, we won't be able to go into the supermarket. We won't be able to fly. And say, yes. That's correct. It is time to let go of those things. So you take those as a gentle nudge to stop using them. See, these are nudging everybody, but they're nudging everybody on those fucking systems. They're nudging you on Facebook and they're doing propaganda in the media and stuff. So as you hear that now you can no longer go and do such and such because of draconian this and that, and you say, well, wave it goodbye. You say, but but I can't go to a cinema. I say, yeah, wave cinemas goodbye. It's time. <laughs> it's time, dudes. Wave them goodbye. It's, yeah. Uh, you let these things go. But you know, it's it's fine being you know fighting from the inside, but you know, just uh, don't have get into this attitude that we're being boxed in and we're surrounded and defeated. Say no, is. It's we're moving slowly away, backing towards the door. Because okay, so like say okay, so now if you have a prepper mindset and you think I'm going to survive this uh, uh, Cold War II hot war, well, who's going to survive? Well, for the people that are furthest away from infrastructure, and so basically the further you are away 
from a nuclear power station, uh, particularly a railway line. You don't want to be near a railway line. Right? So a lot of, if there was a nuclear attack on America, America would do pretty fucking well. What it's likely to be is a um, HAEMP, so a high altitude EMP weapon. And that's where, uh, you know, in, inside the atmosphere, in the upper atmosphere, especially inter intercepted missiles coming in, that make a huge EMP. Uh, wave. It would take out all the, the internet, it would take out the, the grid. Um, but it, a lot of things are hardened in the military. It's very easy to harden things, by the way, but it hasn't been done. Um, they, they've neglected it terribly. One of the things that I don't think a lot of people know is that the internet backbone is, is around railways. So, you know, when the internet came and they they digitized all the analog system from the 50s onwards. Um, they, they laid, so eventually, by the 80s, they were laying uh, fiber optics. So everything's fiber. So the, the backbone of the internet is all high-speed fiber. Uh, so they laid all these, these bundles down the train tracks because they, you know, they didn't have to get eminent domain or dig up shit. Um, the, the railroads already followed all the, the routes that you would want to connect because the, they, they came from the, you know, the era of the railroads. So, uh, like, for example, Sprint is one of the big carriers in the Internet. And I don't think a lot of Americans know that Sprint stands for... Uh, Sprint, by the way, if, you, if you're not American, is, is like... Um, I don't know what a big carrier is. In, it's, it's like BT or something like in the UK. Um, but a lot of people in America, I think, don't know that SPRINT is an acronym. It actually stands for Southern Pacific Railroad Internet. And people uh, people just assume it's a name. But it, it goes down the Southern Pacific Railroad because those were originally the carriers. So for, you know, if you kind of monkey wrench inclined or EMP inclined or you're the prepper that wants to make sure you don't get nuked, is be far away from the uh, railway line. Uh, so all, all of these things are, if, if you think of, you know, who survives, it's basically anybody that's far away from any technical stuff. So if, you, if you're, if you like, in Ireland or, so, and, you know, and you're not, not near any strategic infrastructure, you're in good shape. See the, you see, the way a lot of uh, people talk, you get economists and they're talking about the future, and they will say, well, you know, Europe is a dead zone or something like that. It was, you know, because but you, you want to be in an economically dead zone. Europe is a great place to be, according to my an analysis. And the reason is um, it's, it's rapidly becoming a marsh zone. So during the, the you know, the Cold War, it was, uh, you know, Germany was the sacrifice zone. So they were going to sacrifice Germany for capitalism. Germans were happy about that, but the, that's no longer the case. It's not, they're no longer big, you know, tank battalions that are going to roll in from Putin's Russia across Europe. So, so Europe is no, uh, no longer the key battleground. In fact, Europe is sidelined. And so European countries, the more uh, unaligned they are, the more neutral, the more um, they marsh regions, um, the better. So. A lot of them in Europe are going to go towards the right. Everybody's going towards the right. It's 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 not that bad. I mean, you don't want to live, you don't want to live in the to, under the totalitarian left or right. But out of my personal preferences, I'm more scared of the totalitarian left. But the but in terms of um, uh, you know thinking, oh, you know everything's going fash and stuff. It's like no. In some ways, a um, you know. You might be more protected with a right-wing government in Europe. It's not the, the end of the world. You know, you, you, especially if you're an anarchist and it's you Antifa and, oh, it's going over to the right. And that's, it's like, look, the state is the state. Uh, and so uh, both of them are horrendous, left and right. But um, don't, don't get trapped in one or the other and think that the right is so much worse than the left. No, it's not. That way. In fact, there's, you know, you might, there might be some protection in being a little bit right wing in terms of a, um, a hot war and even the cold war.
If um, if China, so to say, so say if America launches this, are they somehow aggravate China to you know, and they or they get the the signal that they can right, that's it, we're ready, we're going to launch this attack at China. Isn't China then just going to have all of their pre-programmed missiles just firing off at all of America's allies, and we're just going to end up with you know no more planet like Armageddon? Like what? Well, kind of what I was saying no. before, but is it's not like that. You don't you don't see that no. they've already got, but they just don't have the resources, the missiles, or it's just going to be they're just priming just for America. Yeah, they, they, both sides are trying to win it. They're trying to they're trying to win the war, so they don't do a scattergun approach and stuff. There's, you see, it's it's the balance of nuclear power is is very secret and clandestine and it's based on on particularly how many warheads you can get through the defenses so that that's why all these new high speed so so china's just basically circumnavigated the world with this high speed missile which apparently america wasn't ready for but uh, i think that's in the news today and so what that does is it, it destabilizes the nuclear deterrent because it means that they have to recalibrate what the risk is now. They have to figure out how many of these things do you do, how many of them are going to get through in the war game, and and so that takes a lot of planning. And uh, so you know, it's, it basically makes a big ripple in in the Pentagon and stuff like that. But you see, it, it, you see, it's very very foolish to do these things because if you think of Pooh Bear at the at the card table. He's going to do one of these things, and it's going to be very bad news for him because he's going to say, okay, tips the balance. We're in deep trouble now. And they say, okay, that's it. This is it. Launch. But that's how it's going to be. So so they're both, you know, just at the edge of the precipice. They're, they're, they're really doing brinkmanship. Um, and it's, uh, I, as far as I can see, China's losing hands down. But you see, you see what what America is liable to do. America, I think America wants a nuclear war. I'm pretty well convinced of it. So, um, and they want the shock and all and all of that. So the the um, what they're liable to do is is to trick China into it, to 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 lure China to basically um, take a a weak posture. Um, so you know. Um, you, you see what I mean? Is is they they fake um, a weakness yeah. to provoke an attack? Yeah. The, the U.S. has been trying that for a long time, and China's too smart to fall for it. Yeah, but you see, the, it's so finely balanced. You see, like Puber's career is based on a lot of things. One of them is Taiwan, and so so he can get into a situation where you know is he thinks. He, you know, he he would um, be biased towards um, deluding himself, if you see what I mean. Uh, he so, might in other words, go he, he was going against his better judgment. Yeah, yeah I, I think he's too shrewd um, for uh, to do that before he can guarantee a victory. But um, I, I think so too. I think so too. But but like if uh, the kind of things I imagine is like if. Like, Joe Biden hasn't, I mean, I'd, I would be amazed if he makes it through his term. So it's, you know, Kamala Harris and stuff as President Harris, um, I think would be a very weak president. <laughs> and and she's very liable to overcompensate because I think she has a huge imposter syndrome. It's not, it's not really imposter syndrome. She's an imposter, so she's got, got it right. Yeah, but it, anyway, I, I just wanted to paint the picture of you know the, that's all these things that might look like um, weakness. If you know Joe Biden pops his clogs, um, if Taiwan declares independence, uh, if the stock market uh, tanks, I mean, all the way down to if if China drains the three gorges down, if they let the water level go, that's that's how close it is that that would trigger war. Oh, uh, hmm. 
Yeah, there are a lot of like interesting maneuvers that that they've been doing recently. Um, like a lot of things right after another. Uh, you know, kind of relocating the center of the financials to the mainland, moving things out of Hong Kong, uh, changing the education system so that you can't have uh, all education has to be government controlled. Um, but these are all happening within a, a month or two um, of, of now. Uh, or they've already happened. Um, I know a lot so, of people. So what's have, all the deal? Let's go ahead. What What's all the deal about them? Uh, you know, getting going anti LGBTQ and going kind of anti woke and stuff. What's all that about? Um, I think it's the uh, ultimately uh, when you have a state, the um, uh, sexual control is one of the the key key factors. So whether you're religious or you have, you know, it's in, um, you know, uh, Mao did that as well. He, like, desexualized people so that he, you can control people because once you, you you take away the food, you take away the sex, you, you make it so that people, um, people are essentially born criminals and um, they have to come through you to, to get basic human needs. So I think that's um, there's, it's different than it is in Russia. So in Russia, it's placating the, the Orthodox Church and the, the, the right um, in Russia. Uh, there is no such religious influence in China. Um, it's, it's ultimately, um, you know, same, same principle, why would, why would Islam, uh, you know, make it so that uh, it's not, you know, Vegas all the time. <laughs> it's because, you know, it, it gives you, um, you know, control. So if, uh, to be a, um, to be a Chinese man and to have a chance of getting married, you need to be a slave for a long period of time to be able to accumulate a house, which could be a million dollars in some of the major cities, um, for a basic house. Uh, you need a car, you need to have, you know, a good career and stable prospects um, before it's even, you're even considered because uh, there's too many men due to the one-child policy and the, and the infanticide um, compared to the women. So the women have the pick of their litter and um, it's uh, the, pretty much all of society is about sexual control and sexual delayed gratification. So if you want to have that sex, you have to be a slave for 20 years um, in order to have offspring and, and to experience that. And very often the dating culture here is, um, you know, once you start dating, like Chinese to Chinese, once you start dating, it's, um, it's uh, there's an expectation of, okay, now we've been on two dates, let's start talking about marriage, right? Let's, <laughs> uh, how is this gonna work? And in fact, it gets to the point where there are um, that there's just so much family pressure and it's the, the script that you have to follow as a, as a citizen is much stricter, um, much, much tighter, um, uh, enforcement by the family than, than is in Western cultures. So, um, and this is, you know, part of Confucianism and this kind of thing is it, you know, Chinese culture is much more stable over time, um, because of, because the, it's not, you know, each generation gets its wildly new way of doing things. It's like the, a lot of the decision making happens um, a generation or two before the current generation. So um, uh, often, it, you know, there were some arranged marriages, but it's not like that quite anymore, but it's more like um, there, there's pressure and matchmaking done um, uh, where there are these markets um, where, uh, parents will go, you know, shop around for their children to, to get married, like find a spouse for them and this kind of thing. And if you do not get married by 30 and you're a woman, there's a lot of pressure on you because you're considered like uh, a left behind woman, like a piece of trash, right? That, that is unwanted because there's this, you know, fetishization around um, youth and the ability to have children and the, um, the uh, 
just this expectation of um, once you're old, it's it's uh, you're you're not a desirable person anymore. And that's um, that's the other form of you know the cultural control. Um, so there's uh, and all of this leads to essentially very high end um, uh, effective um, control over people to do lots of labor <laughs> for for the for the companies and for the state. So um, uh, another thing that happened recently is um, the government just banned children uh, from being able to play more than a, uh, I think two hours of video games a week. Um, so that's a new new law. Um, various things like this. Um, yeah, the, the, and I have to say that the level of intelligence, or at least education, um, it's far higher. There are much more international thinkers, much more um, open-minded people, uh, educated people in China than I've seen in the West because of this, you know, strict, these strictures. Um, that it pushes people to be smarter. Um, and there's a, there's a culture of cultural exchange where it is ex expected if you are of a certain class that you will study abroad uh, and you'll see the world and you'll bring that cultural nuance back. And so there's a lot of um, uh, uh, just incredible um, entrepreneurial culture rather than having um, like an employee employee mindset as as much, which is a, it's a strange thing. So there's like a lot of a lot of pressure to to have something stable. So that, uh, even some of the entrepreneurs may be a little less in terms of the risk taking, but there's uh, it's it's considered normal for if you need money, you just start a business. Uh, but you do a business that's less risky than other people. So you would go. Um, like if someone has a successful hot pot restaurant, you'd go open up a, su a successful hot pot <laughs> restaurant next to them, right? Like it's, um, and this is going to actually some of the, the, um, the uh, Darwin was wrong videos. That you, like this is a phenomenon in China that makes no sense if you look at, you know, typical um, uh, uh, competition mindset. Right, because people don't cluster next to their competitors. Oh, clustering, yeah, they're clustering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but that, that bears out in Chinese economics. Do you, do you um, hear much about the Uyghurs, or do they hide that That's, in the news? Uh, the, well, I don't follow any of the state media here, so I don't know if that's talked about. But I think a lot of that is um, Western propaganda. Um, there's, there's certainly that's being done, but uh, it's, it's being done, you know, uh, you, just like you don't hear about the black sites in Turkmenistan for the U.S. in the U.S., right? Like you, you don't, you don't get that get doesn't get talked about. So it's, uh, it's various countries airing each other's dirty laundry and then using it to say, look at these demons on the other side. But they're all demons. They're all states. Yeah, we just saw, I just saw this headline now that the Taliban are taking Uyghurs, Uyghur refugees uh, and repatriating them back to China to the peril. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny because um, China actually <clears throat> is way smarter in terms of dealing with terrorism. So if there's a, if there's a Muslim uh, like jihadi bombing in a city, um, you never hear about it. It doesn't get publicized. It doesn't create, um, you know, bunch of security theater around it and all this stuff. It's it goes ignored, which is exactly the way you disincentivize terrorism, right? In the the way the what, US what do you mean like like the, like the fire in in Kent? You mean the the fire in the in the power connection to France and Kent? You mean like that? You know, um, I actually don't really hear about it. I didn't hear about that, so. <laughs> See, it works. <laughs> it works, yeah. But actually, nobody's talking about this thing. I mean, it's just tiny, tiny. Once a week, I read a little thing about that they're repairing, and it's going to take two years. 
there's been nothing about the fire nothing how it started and that place i know that place near the tunnel and it's ex there's enormous surveillance there's fences everywhere it's a big place where there's a lot of traffic and a lot of things a lot of people passing there so there's an extremely extremely sophisticated surveillance so i mean you know there's nothing they don't even say it's an accident really it's not even cyber attack well it's a fire cyber attack <laughs> yeah no a fire no that is Ryan, the kind of a, things you do you see they, they Ryan, it's a, all the it's things a are cable, it's systems. a cable that runs under the channel that was bringing the power from france to england and there was a fire so the cable was stopped and the, the supply of electricity to England is interrupted from France, which is an enormous percentage of their cheap energy that's coming from nuclear energy. So, and they're going to be two years without that. Basically, that's the story. Uh, it, basically, they're going to, they have to fire up all the coal-fired power stations and they've blown all the Paris targets. But, the, um, no, uh, Sophie, the, a fire is a very likely result of a, of a cyber attack. So what they, all these systems are SCADA systems and they they all control the machinery. So if you, uh, it's, it, they try to get things like, you know, shut down cooling things and ramp up, um, ramp up something that needs cooling, you know, all that kind ah, of thing. And then if they get okay. it right, there'll be a, a catastrophic fire. And stuff. So don't assume a fire is some guy mm. in a hoodie, you know, climbing over a fence to monkey wrench it. It's, <laughs> it's more likely to be, uh, you know, cyber. <laughs> Yeah, I thought yeah. the timing on that was just far too good. Like, clearly, yeah, and I completely agree. It, it on has that all well. the smell. It has all the smell of a cyber attack. I, when when stuff like that happens, I, I feel very much like I'm in South Africa or the Soviet Union or stuff because you you see stuff that's so obviously they're not telling you the full story, and then you you're forced to like guess and thinking. You know, and, and you get little drips that give you hints about what it, but that's what it's like living. This is the world we're going to be living in more and more and more. It's kind of 1984 where you, where you will get these little hints and you think, hang on a minute. That's a huge fucking story. Anyway, moving on. And then, there was, you you know, you, the story does, gets kind of suppressed. It doesn't make any sense. You go piece it all together yourself. But it, it is possible. You've got to got to keep uh, focusing on stuff like that but I, I maybe I'm dreaming but I'm seeing this all over the place right uh, yeah in relation to that one sorry we've digressed from this China talk but yeah who I mean who would you think would why why would they do that I mean obviously it suits the sort of the energy crisis agenda like all of this you know i mean we are mass i mean uk is screwed like our, the energy policy is just a, a disaster you know we're heavily reliant on gas um, and they built loads of windmills and we haven't had any wind so yeah um it, actually funnily enough there was a documentary a bbc documentary called blackout from 2004 and I couldn't believe how well it actually laid out. It was almost down like they had the scenario, there was a black swan. It took out something in the, um, Eastern Europe, gas pipeline. We were, and in the documentary, they were saying we were at this time, hypothetically, it was like in 2010, the UK is reliant on like 60 or 70 percent um, of their fossil fuel makeup was gas um, in the documentary and then there's a problem with like the renewables and of course there's a black swan and then we have all these blackouts and it was it was from years ago it was a uh, you know it was almost very the parallels were quite striking but um i just wonder yeah, who would yeah. be who would, hey, Tom, would, you, would you post that would you post that tom it would be interesting if you have the link to that document. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's quite an old documentary, but yeah, it's on Thanks. YouTube. It's just called Blackout. So, so in in terms of the the cyber war landscape, it's it's a complete mess. It's you kind of have to imagine Syria or something, but going on in the background in the cyber war. So, if you have any server, it, it's probably a, a, any server that. Hey, you know, it's addressable on the web as as a name server. It probably gets hit, um, you know, once every th uh, three seconds. 
would would be a malicious attack. There are a lot of things like crawlers and stuff, so you can't really tell who who's accessing it. But you can see these things being probed. Any server, server your machine now would be probed all the time. And so the who's doing it is a zoo. The the state actors. Putin uh, has this amnesty for for hackers in in understanding that they don't attack him. So there's uh, a lot of organized crime networks and the ransomware in hidden within those guys are a lot of state actors but the vast majority of the shit going on is america and israel um going outwards um then uh, but everything from nigerian scammers to anonymous guys and uh, e more and more now i think they're the eco eco terrorists but not enough of those but there's so many parties that are getting in on this that it's um, you know it's, it's starting to look like a ghetto on in, you know, on the internet. Yeah, and something we should say also is just how asymmetrical it is between defense and offense. So um, offense is almost always, you know, I, I would say ten times easier than defense. Um, like with with or or even more than that because. With with um, with defense, you have to defend against every possible threat. Um, but if you slip up once, you're hosed. Um, so uh, all of the skew is on the offensive side. Like all you have to do is succeed once, and you got it. Um, but they have to never fail uh, on the defensive side, and that's that's just a much taller order. Yeah, a lot of the machines. Um, so you know the the. It's happening silently. So a lot of these machines are bots for people, you know, um, for cyber attacks and stuff. So they sold in bulk on the web. You, and, you know, when, when people break into a machine, they don't automatically wrap it up in ransomware and charge you with Bitcoin. What's more likely is they would, um, they would sell all your details, they'd scrape all the machine and stuff. And once they've got rid of that, they'll, they'll sell the access on the dark web. And then what somebody will do is put a bot on your on your machine, and you can see it, you know, going out, um, then looking for other machines. So it 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 looks very much like a virus. It looks very much like a pandemic. As this the if you uh, in terms of cybersecurity, uh, it's remarkable how analogous it is to to virology and pandemics and how how you know viruses propagate. I mean it's. You know, they call it computer viruses, and people think it's an analogy, but it's very, very, very apropos. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a reflection of um, of a lot of what's going on in the surface in terms of uh, the financial war, trade war, or, you know, hot war. But all of them are heating up. You see, all of them are heating up. If you look at the trends of the direction. Uh, you know, the, like the UK just made a cyber, I can't remember, cyber, cyber, whatever they called it. But anyway, it's a cyber offensive arm. It's, it's like Talpiot or Unit 8200 in Israel and so But where, you see more and more of these people are making these countries that were kind of, you know, back backwaters like Sweden or something. They, they starting to do uh, cyber uh, attack uh, uh, or just just cyber warfare departments, and those are, are going to grow and grow and grow, and those those guys immediately start attacking. So you know, I I can't. I think this whole system is going to come down because uh, just just the elephants are fighting each other. I think it is possible that um, any any technology that relies on computing is going to become too much of a liability to maintain. Uh, if if it if you get AI to the point where it can offensively attack any surfaces that you want, um, then uh, you know no matter what kind of defensive techniques you used, you know it will have been tra trained against <laughs> a lot of those, um, and so uh, it just becomes like Battlestar Galactica, where you just you just stop using tech because um, it's all infected. Yeah, I kind of think of it like a ghetto. So it's uh, you know, it, you know, it's uh, it's kind of like a a neighborhood that's going to pieces. So if you if you think of the dream of the 
the tech heads back in Silicon Valley in the 80s. And now it's kind of the CD ghetto that's kind of like, you know, um, uh, Biff's, Biff's, uh, Biff's town, Biffville or whatever that was in, in Back to the Future. And so, you know, it, you imagine that these companies that are, you know, get all their systems locked up with ransomware and then you know, they're paying out, they're paying out the ransoms. And then it's like, can you imagine that gets to be so that you get held up like that, you know, every, every six months. You, you're just packing the company, you know? it's, it's like, and that's where we're getting to. It's eventually you just people leave leave town. <laughs> just, I honestly can't wait. Uh, like, I mean, I just I can't wait for the day that, like, I don't know, UK government website goes down. I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I just yeah, all these systems thing. Like, I just, I just, I would love to, the glee of seeing everybody going. Oh God! Like, look what's happening. Like, the world's falling apart. We can't use our phones. Oh no! <laughs> like yes, yes. <laughs> the bliss for the bliss. <laughs> well, you see, this is how the system comes down. Is is when the average person starts thinking that we ain't got long to go. Yeah, maybe we should end it on that note. But that that is the that is the the takeaway lesson from all of this is that tell your friends. Tell everybody you know, you know, let, first let them lose faith in the system, then let them uh, eventually, you know, they, they come over to our side and we'll go through the looking glass and then they'd like, you know, they stop thinking of all these headlines in The Guardian that go something like, oh, the world's coming to an end, such and such was ransomware, so this is being, it's like, oh, it's terrible. It's like, no, it's glorious. <laughs> And there are more people that think that way, the uh, the faster we can get over all this shit. But anyway, uh, yeah, just one final word on the. But, but yeah, but the same applies. Is it, uh, if business as usual is so dangerous that even if we had a nuclear war, it would be better. So this, you know, even if you heard that there was. Um, you know, nuclear weapons being used in the South China Sea, you should celebrate because at the current trajectory we're on is so, so dangerous that anything, even nuclear war, would be better than business as usual. So I just want to leave that thought with you. Yeah. Okay, unless anybody, does anybody else want to say anything? They got something burning to say? Oh, okay, kind of tiring. Well, well, let, let's just pause and do our usual and just... It's kind of stressful. Get, look, can't help you talking about these subjects. They're kind of weighty and they get your cortisol going and get you a little bit worried. And it's important to realize that the... Even if the bombs start dropping, they're not dropping now. So enjoy it. Just cherish every minute that uh, that you have now, where it's uh, calm, peaceful, and all of this is just a distant dream. Om Paramatma Namaha. Good. <laughs> Interesting one. <laughs> Thank you yeah, for all you. that information, yeah. Ryan and you and everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Al. Bye, everyone. Have all a good right. week. Have a good Thank one. You. Bye now. Bye now. Bye now.